It feels like nuclear physics to me. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gail Pauly, and Gail is going to walk you through some Title I issues as well. Well, Doug set the stage for Title I because everything he said, except for a couple parts about the fiscal, are the same things that are in Title I. So I thought about maybe a different way for us to think about um, some of the pieces from both programs for Title I Part A, regular, and Title I Part A, RRA. And the two words that I would like you to think about are focus and explore. Because as we look at the uh, requirements for Title I Part A, the focus is on low achieving students and how we serve those low achieving students by both programs. The rules apply to both programs. There's a new guidance, as Bob explained earlier, on the use of funds that um, will help you get to the other word, and that's explore. As you look at exploring the information in that use of funds, there are going to be some new ideas in there for you to think about. So if you look at this first slide, uh, it's pretty much exactly what Doug was saying. The funds are there to stimulate the Title I program to support those lowest achieving students in your schools. Um, they're short term, they're going to go away eventually. And the bottom line for all of these programs that we're talking about is to improve student achievement, but in particular Title I. Um, and this just goes on to talk to you a little, a little bit more about the poverty piece to really emphasize that that's the focus once again. Um, the funds, as Doug said and Bob said and Zali said and I think David said too, that the funds are short term. They're only here for two years. We have um, the, uh, the chance to look at exploring together some different ways and using those funds to better support our lowest achieving students. So this slide just talks about some examples. Um, the bottom line is to ensure that Title I eligible students are taught by highly effective teachers. So that's the focus. Um, and as we also um, think about not just Title I but all of ARRA, um, the, really what we're after is ensuring that our students receive the services of um, highly qualified teachers and that they continue to have those services with the multiple cuts that many of you have been dealing with over this last year. And so with the ARA funds, there's a potential that you can rehire some of those staff. Uh, and as Doug said just a minute ago, uh, there's unprecedented level of reporting, and Joel Lynn will be talking about that in a little bit, and the uh, public scrutiny. Um, I was in Arkansas uh, two or three weeks ago, and I was driving along the freeway, and there was a big sign that said, paid for by ARRA funds. Um, so I'm thinking we need to start putting up those road signs, <laughs> paid for, our school, on your school signs, paid for by ARRA funds to support our schools. And maybe we could send that back to Washington, D.C., Allen. So um, the good news, first of all, I congratulate the Title I directors in this room, the school district directors, because we have almost all of your applications into our office. So give yourself a pat on the back for that. The other good news is that um, I got very few responses to my barrage of emails before school started that said, please respond to this waiver. We got all eight of the eight waivers that we applied for. So those include the 14-day notice, and this is specific to those schools that this was their first year of being in step one. So you, uh, if you ask for that waiver, then the letter that you had to send to parents um, 14 days before, for all the rest of you that had schools and school improvement, that was waived so the letter only had to go to schools by the first day of school. 
Um, another one was that those schools and districts that had been identified for improvement um, that wanted to become a supplemental educational service provider, um, there is a part in the law that says you can't if you're an improvement. Well, we have that waived. So I think that's great because we have uh, 13, Reg, where are you? I'm not sure if he's in the room right now. 13 or 14 schools and a couple of districts that have, are now eligible to be supplemental education service providers where the knowledge is about our kids. Um, if you are a step one school, used to be public school choice was the only uh, opportunity that you could fund. Now, if you so choose, you could fund supplemental services and public school choice if you're in step one. Probably the biggest ones are the next three. Uh, and I see a few heads shaking out there. Uh, you had to set aside 20% of your Title I funds if you had schools and public school uh, and schools and uh, improvement. And that 20%, I know when I first, uh, when we first instituted this, um, there was a school district that that meant about a million dollars. So that was all of their reading coaches for the whole district. So that's, that is just an enormous takeaway from the support systems that we have for our children. So now the 20% of the ARRA funds that would have been required if you asked for that waiver, you uh, may now uh, not have to include that in that 20%. The same thing for 10% for professional development for districts and 10% for those schools and school improvement. The uh, seventh one deals with the per pupil set aside and at one point you would have to include both ARRA and regular Title I and determining how much that would be. If you ask for that waiver it's just your regular Title I. And the last one that I think is going to assist many of you is the 15% waiver. And I was rereading this last week because I had a question about uh, who can actually um, ask for the waiver in this area, and then what did it really mean? Was it both programs, Title I, regular, and ARA, Title I? And I said, I think it's only one, but I'll check. So here's the answer to that question. I hope that person is in the room. The waivers may be used for either as long as you receive ARRA funds. Okay, got that one. And I think that will really assist many of you. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Janelle. And, and while Janelle moves up here, I would like to have all of the uh, Title I staff that are in the room that will be here the next two days uh, so you know who they are so you can go ask them questions besides uh, Janelle and Doug and Bob and I. So, any of our Title I staff that are in the room, would you please stand up? Okay, and also the um, special ed, I'm just, Doug, I'm gonna ask your special ed staff to stand up too. Uh, there's Reg at the back door. And then also, Janelle's already right, asked your staff, it would be Bill, right, to stand up. <laughs> So those are the other staff from OSPI that are here that please ask any of us questions at any time and we will be more than happy to help find the answers if we don't know them or give the answers if we do. So thank you very much. Well, good morning. I too am glad to be here this morning. Um, I think my seat was a little bit warm when I walked into this room and my seat keeps getting hotter and hotter as the day goes on. Uh, I received the guidance from the Department of Education on August 27th, so I've had a month to be able to think about the challenges, the new opportunities, the change in metrics on how we're going to evaluate which schools are making sufficient progress and which aren't. Um, and I'm trying to imagine what it's like for those of you who have had a narrow band of focus and are hearing all of this put together, how complicated it truly is. And what I'd like to reinforce for you is that when you have some time to think about it and put the pieces together and actually uh, recognize that there are strong common threads that are running through all of these requirements 
and that for the first time in my educational career, it seems like we're really talking about systemic change.